Commander Goroskin stood atop the battlements, if the blocky assemblage of Ferrocrete could even be called such, and surveyed the battlefield through his binoculars. Lines of trenches surrounded the central bastion, all of them manned by regiments of the guard. Several artillery batteries were in place as well, their heavy barrels pointed out in all directions. In the distance, their armor rolled with a rumbling, clanking tread that shook the ground. Huge iron hedgehogs were embedded with their spines facing outward in a haphazard pattern that made them nearly impossible to navigate, and hidden within their shadow were caltrops, with hooks to prevent them being torn out once they'd sunk in. Though it was hard to see, he knew there were stretches of razor wire, along with carefully concealed landmines just waiting for an unwary step. Outpost Avernus would be a tough nut to crack, but as an explosion lit the sky and the Vox crackled to life, he knew the enemy was about to try. The Orcs had been circling for days now, looking for a good fight. There had been skirmishes across the region, but every time the fighting had been about to get heavy, he'd ordered a withdrawal. Under the cover of support fire, his units had retreated drawing more and more of the burgeoning host away from other forts and towards Avernus. The other regiments had been ordered not to engage, and to only fire if fired upon. Every time that had happened, Goroskin had sent out raiders to attack the orc's flanks, and to draw even more of them towards his position. Now it looked as if word had gone through the enemy's ranks that the outpost was to be made an example of by the green-skinned bosses. All goes as you commanded, Inquisitor, Gedoskin said after he confirmed the message had been received. It looks like we're surrounded. Inquisitor Hargrave hadn't smiled once since she'd made Planetfall two weeks ahead of the rock that had brought the orcs to the northern half of the world of New Canaan. But now, in the center of an oncoming storm of blood and violence, her lips quirked. Her smile was thin as a razor and sharp as her high cheekbones. She nodded, the only indication that she'd heard what Goroskin had said. She stood there for a minute. That one minute became five, which became ten. Fifteen minutes after the transmission had been received, they caught sight of the Greenskin Vanguard. The invasion force was small by Orc standards. Even so, the host that had drawn towards Avernus numbered in the hundreds of thousands, if not the millions. Wave upon wave of roiling, roaring orcs decked out in garish colors and carrying a wide variety of arms and armor. Through his glasses, Goroskin saw one of the bosses in primitive power armor, haranguing their troops forward. Tanks rumbled across the churned earth, belching black smoke. There were no fighters in the air, thank the God Emperor, but there were occasional roaring speed freaks who soared on rocket packs as they conducted aerial recon of the outpost. Lot of orcs, Kira said. The woman was tall enough she could look over the crenellation just by standing up straight. Dressed in dirty fatigues and a tactical harness that held a variety of weapons, she seemed unperturbed by the sight. She loosely held a long lass in one hand, the number of hash marks on the stock too many to be easily counted. She'd moved her red bandana to her bicep so she could comfortably wear a helmet but that was her one concession to personal protection. The Katachan had been in charge of preparing the battleground for the Greenskins, and she had pulled out every trick that thrice-cursed Deathworld taught her before she became part of the Inquisitor's retinue. Draw them in, Commander, Hargrave said. Fire at will. Goroskin gave the word, and all hell broke loose. The big guns fired, dropping a rain of artillery into the Orc's ranks. Light bloomed from the trenches as the sharpshooters began firing, taking aim at the biggest and nastiest of the orcs that had gotten within range. Heavy bolters ripped into the enemy, joined by the occasional blinding flares of plasma discharge. Even the armor joined the chorus, repositioning itself and firing a welcoming salvo from their big guns before rolling back along pre-chosen routes. It was chaos and carnage and orcs died in droves under every wave of fire. For every one of them who fell, a dozen more fought over who got to take their place on the front lines. What discipline the great horde possessed stretched to the breaking point, 
and then snapped. As one, they raised their battle cry, and millions of tons of pumping muscle and thumping iron descended on the humans who stood defiantly against them. They charged, with guns blazing and choppers swinging, each trying to be the first to reach their foes. While most of their shots went wide, and no few slammed into their own ranks, sheer numbers meant the front line defending Avernus wouldn't last long. And while the passive defenses slowed the onslaught somewhat, and the guardsmen gave good account of themselves, there was no way they would be able to hold out against this force for long, much less carry the day. Inquisitor, Gadoskin said, watching as their outlying armor was overrun, and the first line of trenches filled with vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting that barely lasted a minute before the orcs were already moving to the second line. I don't mean to. Hargrave didn't speak. She simply raised two fingers, cutting off the commander's words as thoroughly as if she'd sliced off his tongue. She glanced at Kira. The Katachan frowned out at the carnage, the way an art critic might look at a work in progress that showed potential. After a moment she shrugged, the black tattoo on her shoulder of some horrifying creature wriggling as the muscle beneath it rose and fell. We could wait, she said. I'd say they've committed. By Scorpia, Hargrave said without looking away from the furious battle below. Status! A figure in red robes glanced up as the Inquisitor addressed it. The tech priest had probably been human, once, but it was impossible to be certain of anything beyond that now. A long metal mask covered its face, the pumping rebreather and half-dozen lenses giving it the look of an asthmatic spider. The mobility assembly didn't help that impression. The six steel legs and mechadendrites working in concert as the Martians scuttled about its tasks like a diligent crab. The weapon is fully operational. The Biologos droned, the Vox grill and its mask crackling. No issues detected. Gadoskin frowned. When Hargrave had arrived bringing her dark tidings about the oncoming orcs, she'd reassured them that she had brought a powerful weapon with her. Something that, once deployed, would destroy the Greenskins utterly and completely if they could draw the majority of their forces to a single physical location. Her confidence had meant the planetary forces had been all too happy to follow her lead and to redeploy as she saw fit. Her orders had been followed to the letter, and Goroskin had been assigned as her personal aide-de-camp, as he was the senior officer in charge of Avernus, and he was the most capable of offering insights about the outpost and its surrounding area. With all the preparations that had been made, and all the assignments that had been shifted, Gadoskin had not seen a hint of any sort of weapon. No communications had left from the outpost to remote areas or off-world. All she had brought was her retinue. The tech priest, the Katachan, and a skinny boy in a too big greatcoat with a drawn face and dark, watchful eyes. He had been little more than Hargrave's shadow always a few steps behind and to one side of her. She'd never once acknowledged him though, aside from a single reprimand when he'd stated the trenches needed to be wider if they were going to catch enemy tanks in addition to providing cover. It had been wise advice, but he hadn't spoken since. Krieger! Hargrave said, her voice cracking like a whip. The boy stepped forward, striding at a quick march before taking up position next to the Inquisitor. He stood with his hands at his sides, and his face forward. He showed no fear at the explosions and battle cries, or at the thunderous guns that sent tremors through the earth. If anything, he seemed at home, comfortable even. Do you see the enemy? Hargrave asked. Yes, Inquisitor! Krieger said. His voice was clipped, but Garoskin heard it crack slightly. I do not wish to! Hargrave opened a small satchel at her hip and handed Krieger something. Gadoskin watched as the boy unfolded it and slipped it over his head. Before he'd been given command of Avernus, Gadoskin had spent time all over the sector, and he had fought alongside a dozen different regiments of the Imperial Guard. He had slain the enemies of the God Emperor alongside Cadians, 
swapped drinks in the canteen with Valhallans, and traded exaggerated stories of valor with Necromundan spiders. He'd seen Tempestus Scions in action, witnessed the march of the Mordian Iron Guard, and watched Elysian drop troops land deep strikes on enemy command outposts. Garoskin had only seen gas masks like the one the boy wore, the dirty, white front plate and the black lenses giving it the look of a death's head once. Once had been more than enough for him. As Garoskin heard the boy's breath rasp in and out, he realized that Krieger was not a name. It was a designation. Krieger stepped forward and surveyed the battlefield with his hands resting on the battlement. He stood there, motionless, watching the tide of greenskins roll through the men below, all of them converging on Avernus with the intention of smashing it down to its very foundations. For a moment, everything seemed to hang frozen in the air. The air grew thick and heavy, like the tension just before a lightning strike. The scent of ozone wafted on the breeze. And then it happened. A hammer slammed into the ground, shaking the very earth. Soil flew up, spraying outward as if an orbital strike had crashed right into the greenskin's flanks. Thousands of them were dead in an instant, while hundreds more flew through the air, bellowing from splintered bones and torn limbs, digging furrows through the ground when they finally landed. Tanks that had been caught in the strike caught fire and exploded, their ordnance flying in all directions, ripping even more holes in the enemy's ranks. The sheer violence of the strike was enough that it slowed the orc's charge. Some milled around, confused as to what had just happened. Others stumbled, trying to run around the flattened, bloody ground as if they might dodge a similar fate. Fights broke out, as suddenly every one of them wanted to be standing somewhere else. Krieger drew a deep, rattling breath and continued his work. More great impacts smashed into the ground beyond the Venus, each one larger than the last. They sent rivers of blood into the dry soil, the pressure of the strikes igniting munitions and causing chain reactions as fuel fires burned through the enemy force. One moment the orcs were roaring, rampaging, shooting and hacking. The next they were dead and dying, crushed flat or blown to pieces by the shockwave. Some leaped into the trenches, trying to avoid whatever it was that had turned the battlefield into a meat grinder. But with their reduced numbers, they were cut down by the guard. Kira put her rifle to her shoulder, squeezing the trigger whenever one of the speed freaks drew too near to their position, sending the orcs crashing to the ground with neat, burning holes in their heads. Krieger didn't move a muscle, but a wind began to buffet him. A wind that had no natural origin, and which brought with it the cold, sterile smell of the void. Forks of lightning flicked over and around him, leaving scorch marks on his coat in the ferrocrete where he stood. If he noticed, he paid them no mind. He was utterly focused on breaking the back of the assault that had dared show its face to a Venus. Garoskin tore his gaze away from Krieger and risked a longer glance out at the battlefield itself. The mayhem wrought by the invisible assault was having a noted effect on the battle. The orcs, who had come with nothing but bloodlust on their minds, seemed to realize they'd run into a situation they weren't able to overwhelm with sheer numbers. Some tried to push the assault forward, but it was a trickle compared to the ocean that had previously run toward their walls. A trickle that the artillery emplacements, landmines and ranked fire of lasguns was mostly able to handle. As the advance stalled out, another ground-shaking strike landed. It flattened several hills, and debris flew out in what looked like a kilometer wide radius. Stones and gore rained from the skies, joined by jagged steel, burning scrap and splintered bones. Tanks leaped into the air like toys, falling on their sides. Half the trenches collapsed, the carefully laid support lumber snapped like toothpicks. Even the outpost itself shook, several cracks appearing in its foundations. Krieger let out a harsh breath and bent forward. The wind that had swirled around him abated, the snapping sparks of electricity vanished, and he fell like a puppet with its strings cut. Gadoskin managed to catch him, getting a shoulder up under the boy. Krieger's breath rattled in his mask, his chest rising and falling rapidly. 
by Scopia lifted their data slate, watching as figures and charts fluctuated. The tech priest's lenses whirred and shifted to follow all of the information being fed to them. Inquisitor, the Biologos said. The subject. Do not distract him by Scopia, Hargrave said, gazing out at the battlefield. She frowned at the smoking craters and the sheer destruction that had been wrought in no more than a handful of minutes. She watched as the last of the frontline assault died under the guns of the guardsmen, and the rest of the horde retreated as fast as their legs would carry them. It wasn't as fast as they might have gone, running over the shattered stone and broken bodies of their former comrades, but it was fast enough to make it clear there wasn't any fight left in them. The Inquisitor turned and leaned down until her face was even with the boy, the weapon she'd brought to New Canaan. Get up, Krieger, she said, her voice an iron fist in a velvet glove. There are more of them! Inquisitor, Gadoskin said, but Hargrave ignored him. You know what you did, Krieger, Hargrave said, her voice barely above a whisper. The Emperor knows. He is watching you. He's waiting to see if your heart is truly pure. If your world, if your people can truly redeem themselves in his eyes. To see if you are willing to do what is necessary to defeat his enemies. Krieger jerked, as if every word driven into him was a dagger. Gadoskin tried to hold him, but the boy shoved himself back to his feet. He stumbled, grabbing hold of the gap in the stone. Hargrave watched, her face impassive as Krieger pulled himself to his full height, supporting his weight on his hands. His breath tore in and out of his throat, the mask making him sound like an engine trying to shake itself apart. The wind returned, buffeting all of them like a gale. Electricity sparked from him, burning patterns around his hands and feet. Hargrave grinned and the expression was full of such cold malice that it sent a shudder through Garoskin's marrow. For the Emperor! The boy screamed. For Krieg! A crack ripped through the air like thunder. Outpost Avernus shook and Ferrocrete snapped off, falling to the ground in thick chunks. The wind raced out in all directions from Krieger, flattening everything that went before it. The trenches and emplacements were safe, but a roiling tide of bodies and blood marked the wave of Krieger's mind. The orcs roared and fired at it, as if their weapons could kill the death coming to claim them. The tide rolled over them, adding them to the butcher's bill. When it was done, and nothing moved between the trenches and the horizon, Krieger sagged forward, his head on his arms. He shook, though whether he was weeping or it was merely spasmodic twitches of an overworked nervous system, Garoskin couldn't tell. By Scopia, Hargrave said. Tend him. I want a full report as soon as you're finished. Yes, Inquisitor, the tech priest said, scuttling forward on their steel assembly. Kira leaned her rifle against the wall and took Krieger in her arms. The boy didn't have the strength to fight, even when Kira slid her fingers under the gas mask to remove it. Bloody tears ran down the boy's cheeks, and his nose ran with blood, as if it had been broken or something had ruptured inside him. It was a martyr's face. Commander, Hargrave said, immediately snatching Goroskin's attention away from the boy. With me! Hargrave led Goroskin to the other end of the roof. Krieger was sitting, his head lolling as the tech priest ran scans and attached nodes to him. Kira had removed the red bandana from her arm and was carefully wiping the blood away from his face. Hargrave gestured over the battlements. Look out there, Commander, she said. Gadoskin did as he was bid. He saw his men cheering, their weapons held high. What do you see? I see guardsmen that didn't expect to see another sunrise, celebrating a new lease on life, Gadoskin said. When Hargrave's expression didn't change, he added, I see a victory. The first of many, Hargrave said. When your commanding officers ask what happened here, you are going to tell them that we deployed a unique form of orbital targeting weaponry. 
That is the reason we needed all of the orcs to converge on this one location. And that is why we couldn't have any reinforcements come on the enemy's flanks. They would have been in the blast zone. Geroskin glanced back at Krieger. The boy's eyes had rolled back down from his skull, but he still looked dazed. Kira held a canteen for him to drink from, while Biscopia held his wrist and touched his neck, checking vital signs along with his brainwave patterns. The commander turned back to the Inquisitor. With all due respect, Inquisitor, the boy is a psyker, Galoskin said. The Imperium has been fielding them for centuries. Why lie about this? Hargrave's expression didn't change. Her stance didn't shift. Despite that, Galoskin had the sense he had just put his hand in the lion's mouth. Or maybe his head. That boy is a genetic anomaly, Commander, she said. He was rejected, deemed unfit for service. It was only by accident that I happened to be on hand to stop him from being used for nothing more than target practice. Hargrave turned and looked out at the battlefield. She watched the guardsmen set fresh perimeters, looking for comrades and occasionally putting a las round into the body of orcs that were still twitching. She raised her eyes to the charnel field beyond and took in the ocean of blood that had been spilled. Spilled at her command, by a boy barely old enough to shave. He can win battles, Garoskin. There's no doubt of that. His strength grows a little more every time I push him. Hargrave shook her head slowly before she fixed the commander with her gaze. But if we can pinpoint that anomaly and engineer it to happen again and again, they could win wars. Entire crusades, even. Garoskin felt icy fingers run down his spine. All he could see in his mind's eye was a firing line of gas-masked psychers, their minds exploding outward with the regularity of a metronome. He imagined entire battle formations being torn apart without a single trigger ever being touched. Cold sweat trickled from his temples as he asked himself what a company of men like Krieger could do. A regiment. An army. Hargrave nodded. You understand, Gadoskin, she said. Now, if you would, get on the Vox and order the Flamer teams out to scorch the earth. There's a lot of ground to cover, but we don't want the green skins taking root if we can avoid it. The jungle hungers. She starves for the minds that weaken and break from stifling madness. She eats away at the life of men with the mouths of its monsters or the rot of infection. She thirsts for the salted sweat that permeates the body like an epidermal layer of skin. She is a cruel and salivating beast that will never be contented. Since the Third War for Armageddon and the defeat of Orc warlord Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka, the planet's jungle had become a war zone. The spores left behind by the destroyed horde settled and multiplied within the equatorial jungle, breeding a race of feral orcs not bound to Awa or their gods. The orc hunters were formed in the wake of Armageddon's long path to rebuild, to battle and destroy the jungle-born greenskin threat. These hunters went by another name, Skull Takers. Jungle flies the size of small avians hovered around the hulking body of Songbird. She dropped her blade and deftly snatched one out of the air, crushing its lifeblood into her mouth, green innards catching on the crude piercings that lined her lips. Her brother, Baishani, smirked and gestured for her to do it again, pointing two fingers to his own mouth to punctuate the fact that he also wanted to eat. Without looking, she pinched another buzzing jungle fly and held it out to her sibling. Baishani reached to take the living meal, but Songbird crushed the thrumming insect and cracked a sarcastic smile full of filed teeth whilst the ruined bug seeped through her fingers, 
Her brother thumped her on her shoulder with a strength that would deaden a normal arm for a week. But Songbird just shrugged it off, returning the favor and knocking him on his ass. She sat back on the flattened foliage underneath her and continued to run a long knife across the crown of her head, the standard issue long blade of the orc hunters shaving her scalp clean in between the fleshy grooves and raised tissue of intertwining scars. Hunter Ujarek took first guard in the thicket as the three other skull takers attempted to rest and recover from their day's patrol. Propped against gnarled roots, alongside the muscled bulk of Songbird and her equally sized brother Baishani, sat Sergeant Kalyan. The stoic hunter grunted disapprovingly at the brother and sister, flashing cutting, disdainful looks at the siblings every time they raised their voices beyond a whisper. When they had begun their combat patrol there were seven of them. New Bloods Utul, Junai and Tarin had fallen during their second night in the jungle when eagerly trying to prove themselves against a roaming band of boar boys. The four remaining hunters had been tracking the retreating pack of feral orcs for thirteen days, stalking through the humid evergreen jungles of Armageddon in a hope to hit pay dirt when the beast riders returned to their hidden camp. Days seemed to last for eons inside the jungle. Baishani found it impossible to sleep outside of the mildly less unbearable heat of night, instead spending any downtime they had sharpening his scalper. He ran the sharpening puck across the two-foot blade that had seen him through countless savage battles. The lives it had taken would have made his elders proud. It would have been honoured in ritual by his father, forever bonding the blade soul to the ancestral ghosts of war. But that is there, and this is here. And here on Armageddon, there is just violence and death, with little time for honour and tradition. Songbird, Baishani and Sergeant Kalyan were born on the untamed world of Ishun. It was a savage land for a savage people, the rolling plains home to gigantic stalking theropods that hunted their tribes to near extinction. By the grace of the almighty Skyfather and his sons, they had received weapons, the training to use them, and the blessed opportunity to serve the Imperium and the great Star Travelers descended in their metal eagles. Songbird began to snore, and Ujarek could see why the grunts at base looked upon her as little more than the savage greenskin she killed. She was a true brute of a female, almost abhuman in height and muscle, her rippling arms covered in battle scars and self-inked tattoos. Her indigenous tan skin was rarely without a covering of green pigmented camouflage paste or a cracking layer of insect-repelling mud. On a necklace of rope, she proudly displayed the ears, teeth and fingers of past foes as grisly mementos of battle. She had even sported the rotting, flayed face of a feral orc warboss during their last rotation. Ujarek would rather forget that smell. Sergeant Kalyan slumbered as well. An angled, leathery face grimaced as he dreamt, a white-knuckled grip around his unsheathed scalper tightening on his lap. A breastplate of linking bone chinked together as he breathed. Despite his aged, greying appearance, Ujarek knew the truth of what the sergeant was capable of when they engaged the orcs. You had to be as fierce and ruthless as the enemy to survive in this green hell, and Kalyan was a master of brutality. After their last kill run, the old man had to be fitted with two augmetic legs from the knees down by the surgeons at base. They gave the old soldier the ability to walk again, and also served to remind Ujarek to never try and kick a giant squig in the teeth each time he saw the whirring metallic limbs poke from beneath Kalyan's fatigues. The Steel Legion detachment of orc hunters at Cerbera base unaffectionately called him Sergeant Squig Kicker behind his back, but they were never brave or stupid enough to say it to his stony face. Ujarek was the only one of the group native to Armageddon. His merited skills with both Long Laz and Carbine in the last war earning him a placement within the Orc Hunters. The impenetrable language barrier had been a concern to him when he had been recruited into the team of indigenous hunters. Yet over a night of heavy drinking in the garrison's mess hall, he had discovered they shared skills in handling their alcohol and learning arm and hand signals. They also all harbored a hatred for enemies that ruined their respective worlds. Ujarek was not his birth name. That was discarded and replaced over two Terran years ago by his Ishun family in a symbol of brotherhood and to forge spiritual links to their ancestors. These Ishunites liked their rituals, he'd thought at the time of the naming ceremony, listening to Songbird sing tales of her homeland in a language he did not understand. Sergeant Kalyan had mumbled something throaty and repetitive under his breath, 
and used fingers to brush ceremonial war paint across Ujalik's brow and down the bridge of his nose. Baishani had brought the ritual to an end by pressing his meaty forehead against the Armageddon native and speaking his new name. Hells, he thought. At least he'd have the hunters and their ghosts to look after him. This was his new name now. These were his family now. The siblings and the old man. He would fight and die for them. A low, snuffling sound in the bushes snapped Ujalik out of his daydreams. He turned to warn the other hunters, but they were already awake and silently reaching for their weapons. Baishani gave Songbud a look that they all knew meant trouble. The brother had a talent for discerning the sounds of native fauna and the enemy. Kalyan had disappeared like a ghost, stalking his way around the noise, his scalper in one hand and a short-handled Ishan tomahawk in the other. Songbird put her wide back against a tree, her long knife ready to carve into whatever came out of the rustling foliage. Ujalak quietly unfolded his carbine stock and shouldered the weapon. Baishani unclipped a stick bomb from his chest harness and crouched slow and low behind a fallen trunk. The giant boar burst from the bush with a growling squeal. Songbird lunged with her scalper, stabbing it deep into the animal's flank. The creature kicked back in pain with razored hooves, catching her straight in the gut that left a bleeding gash across her stomach. Songbird spat a curse in her native tongue and threw herself on the back of the beast, grabbing a hold around the long tusks and twisting its head sharply to the side. It was impressive enough that the boar could hold Songbird's massive weight as it thrashed in wild circles, but its ability to withstand her scalping blade being turned inside its innards made it easy to see why the feral greenskins favoured them for mounts. Songbird drove the beast into a thick tree, knocking the scents from its hardened skull, and Baishani dived forwards to aid his sister, sweeping his blade low and taking a porcine leg with it. The giant boar cried out as blood poured from the stump. It stumbled onto its side with Songbird still holding on, stabbing her wicked blade into its soft underbelly. Kalyan's growing shadow appeared over the writhing boar. Songbird managed to roll her huge frame out of the way from the hunter who jumped from the tree above. With a seasoned proficiency, the descending blade separated the boar's head from its body in a single cut, and it finally died. Ujalak lowered his carbine and looked upon the three nomadic warriors standing over the bleeding carcass of the giant beast with a rush of pride. Sergeant Kalyan motioned to his two Ishin brethren with a quick, daggering hand gesture, and they all disappeared like stalking felids through a gap in the brush. Ujalak was left behind, staring at the dead animal. Around its body was fastened a saddle, and that meant there was a rider nearby. He re-shouldered his last carbine and pitched into the bush. The jungle of Armageddon lends itself to maddening paranoia, where swift and brutal death can come to you however it desires. It will send unseen horrors that lay submerged in the rivers and swamplands to strip your bones in seconds. It will call forth the predators who wait in perfect stillness until the time to strike and feed. It will hide an enemy army within a labyrinth of timber before an ambush is sprung and your blood waters the earth at your feet. Ujalak kept his carbine high as he scanned for targets through the encroaching ferns, battle adrenaline spiking to the rising sounds and jittering movement of the jungle around him. Ujalak thought of the green-skinned trappers who dug punji pits and wired trip bombs to snag food and, if lucky, the occasional hunter. He did not want to be left to die alone in a hole, skewered on spikes coated in orc shit. The three Ishanites were more proficient with sweeping and dissembling traps than Ujarak, and he knew this, trying his best to catch up and regroup without triggering anything in the undergrowth. Ujarak finally saw the huge flexing shoulders of Songbird and Baishani over the tree ferns. He scanned for the Sarge, but he was nowhere to be seen. The siblings turned and rested their foreheads upon each other's, for a brief second of hushed prayer. This ritual meant one thing. Death was coming. In the clearing ahead, a dark-skinned orc blew a bone whistle in long, piercing bursts. The maniacal greenskin stomped a heavy foot into the ground, its horned helmet slipping over its eyes when it bellowed a spitting tirade to call back its giant boar from the jungle. The other boar boys guffawed at the spectacle parodying its shouts and tantrums as they pulled and punched to control their own mounts. The dismounted orc exploded with rage, issuing challenges of single combat to the laughing riders. Winner takes boar.
Heavy legs thumped to the floor as the largest of the boar boys happily accepted the contest. It had been too long since his last good fight, and this whelp was getting boring. It took two axes from the tack on its boar, hurling one over to the challenger. Without hesitation, the smaller orc pulled the axe from the sucking mud and bounded towards his opponent. The brute met him full charge and swung a skull-breaking punch that knocked the challenger sideways. From his preferred elevated position in the trees, Sergeant Kalyan observed the fight, grasping onto a thick branch with one hand as he made a sequence of quick signals to his waiting tribe mates with the other. Baishani turned back to Ujarak and made the closed-fisted sign to hold. The boar boys howled with excitement as the two warring orcs swung and hefted their axes, sparks exploding from each clash of the mighty chopper blades. The orc brute caught the challenger's axe as it slashed through the air in a decapitating strike. With a hard yank, it twisted the smaller opponent's arm at a cruel angle, the radial bone snapping free of the flesh. The dark-skinned orc shrieked in pain, looking at the ruination of the limb and the vicious forearm wound that gushed green blood. Bellowing a triumphant cry, the gigantic orc ended the contest with a cut so deep it nearly tore its opponent in half. The body hadn't even had a chance to die before the orcs let their boars feast on the warm meat. Kalyan chopped at the air with his signaling arm, and Imperial Hell was let loose. Baishani stick bombs detonated in the middle of the feasting boars, gutting two of the animals with red-hot shrapnel and flinging all the riders to the jungle floor. The mortally wounded beasts kicked out wildly as they tried to stand, their ropey intestines spilling behind them. The four dazed orcs struggled to stand, their axes, spears and sword blades lifting in their stunned hands. A thundering clatter of noise from above as Kalyan let rip with his prize shooter, covering Songbird and Baishani as they closed the distance. An orc reeled as bullets chewed up his arm and chest. It turned to run, but was faced with Songbird pouncing from the brush, swinging her scalper upwards and taking its head off in one brutal hit. She spat on the headless orc before charging for the next. The giant green skin barked what passed as orders as it slinked back towards its mount, the others staring at the brute's retreat in slack-jawed confusion. It pulled its bulk onto the snorting gigantic boar and began to take off into the dense jungle and away from the fight. Fizzing Laz from Ujarek's carbine chased the escaping monster, a rend of flesh exploding from its colossal arm when a flash-boiling bolt found its target. The feral brute wobbled on the saddle gripping the hole where his bulking tricep used to be. The orc snorted in agony, regained its balance, and spurred its steed into the ferns, surrounded by Ujalik's tracer laz burning through the air. Baishani squared off against a dismounted rider, his sister dispatching its clanmate with her knife punched up into a tusk jaw. He tossed his blade from hand to hand, inviting the creature to meet him in open combat. The feral orc pounded his chest and pitched a whistling spear through the air, Baishani negating the obsidian-tipped projectile with a quick sidestep. The spear tip split Baishani's cheek as it skimmed past, but the hunter just smiled for the fresh scar that would stay with him until the day he died. The lone orc began to panic as it beheld the devastated remains of its tribe littering the clearing, and the three camouflage humans advancing as one. Its long face suddenly jerked, contorting into a rictus of pain before it fell forward. Kalyan's scalper burrowed hilt deep into its spine. The old man stood a metallic foot on the dead orc and levered his blade from its back. The four hunters huddled inside the ring of orc corpses and pressed their sodden foreheads together. They felt the rise and fall of their slowing breaths, smelled the drying blood on their armor, and joined together in a blessing to the almighty Sky Father and the spirits that guide. For a half day, the hunters followed the trail of dried blood and boar trampled flora. Kalyan led the pack like a bloodhound canid, traversing the labyrinthine jungle and scenting the invisible pathways to the enemy. Sergeant Kalyan was the unit's tracker, the siblings the muscle, and Ujarak the lasman. It had worked out fine thus far for the group. Everyone knew their role and played it well. The four hunters welcomed the cooling breeze when the trail finally broke into a lush plain the tall orange grass rippling like water in the wind. The beautiful field would have reminded the three Ishan natives of their home planet, 
if it wasn't for the decomposing orc heads grimly displayed on rows of wooden stakes. Swarms of black, bloated corpse flies lined the skins, their maggots and other screw-headed worms hungrily boring out the eyes and mouths. Baishani flicked a look to his sister, and they simultaneously knocked their own knuckles together. Ujadak recognized that hand sign. Rivals. The feral orc tribes of Armageddon existed for war, born from the spores of a dead horde to raid, loot, and destroy. Human settlements and imperial outposts were not their only targets. If one tribe had something bigger or shinier, it was guaranteed another clan was readying to take it with tooth and claw. A green-skinned civil conflict was raging in these parts, and the tribes needed mighty weapons of war. The hunters ducked quickly into the tall grass, when a war horn sounded so loud and deep it seemed to swallow the pressure from the air. An enormous series of rhythmic thumps followed the sound. Their eardrums nearly burst to a further rupture of noise and world-moving quakes. The four hunters had never heard anything so foul and blood-shaking, looking to each other for answers in the tall grass. One more blare of the mighty horn, this time followed by the hissing sound of what seemed to be pistons or mighty steam vents. The accompanying voices of the jubilant orcs were minuscule compared to the thumping abomination that was making its way through the field, their pig grunts and bestial shouts drowned by the protracted horn blasts. Baishani slowly let his burgan fall from one shoulder and opened a front pouch, retrieving a small shaving mirror. He held up the small square glass with a thumb and forefinger, cautiously raising it above the honey orange grass. Ujarak noticed the Ishanite's expression display an emotion he'd never thought he would see from the warrior in a thousand combat runs. Fear. Baishani lowered the looking glass and with shaking hands signaled what he had seen to the prone hunters. Monster. Big. The beast that lumbered from the jungle with thunderous impacts was larger than any gargantuan squig off the orc hunters had ever known to exist. No primer or Picts could have prepared them for the sheer enormity of the abhorrent monster that towered above the treetops, encompassing the plain. Upon its impossibly thick hide and four elephantine legs were lashed great armoured plates, painted in the muted colours of the feral tribe who rode upon its back in a gigantic multi-levelled howder. With ragged flags flying, the howder would have resembled a vast ocean-faring galleon of ancient history if the usual curved contours had not been replaced with jagged, jutting shapes. Squeaking bands of Gretchen danced behind the titanic beast, and a line of boar boys flanked the heavy drumbeat of its crashing footsteps. At the vanguard of the riders, sat high on a boar-drawn chariot, was the brute Ujarek had wounded, its injured arm bandaged with thick canvas and held tight to the body. Leashed to the back of the wagon, a pack of squig hounds snapped at the turning wooden wheels and the bothersome grots that had hitched a ride on the rear of the vehicle. What the hunters had mistaken for a war horn was the Saurus's air-shredding battle call, the imagined steam vents no more than heavy exhales of breath from lungs the size of imperial bane blades. Droplets of tropical warm rain quickly turned to a torrential downpour across the fields, and the hunters reflexively opened their canteens to catch the precious water. They kept their bellies flat to the ground, feeling the monsoon pelt at their backs, waiting until the booming sounds of the immense squiggot's footsteps began to fade. It sounded like distant thunder in the deluge. Sergeant Kalyan rose from the sodden orange grass to see the Saurus and Orc party clearing the plane a click from their position. Millennia old palm trees shattering and falling when the beast began to crush a new path through the jungle. The older hunter took a long drink from his canteen before raising his hand and giving the order to follow. It wasn't a march to war. It was a parley. Under the cover of darkness beside the waterfall cliff face of Harkon Scar, a meeting of two feral tribes broke bread, exchanging herds of squig, weapons, protesting Gretchen, personal collections of looted Imperial Curios, and barrel carts of primitive throat-stripping moonshine. One of the clans was the same that had travelled across the Orange Plain on the colossal Squigoth, distinguished by their muted grey and black armour. The other, a tribe that painted their skin and dyed their chainmail with the deep purples and viridescent colours of their own biome within the jungle. Aside the convergence of green skins, the Saurus slept, 
oblivious to the band of mingling orcs upon its decked back that banged away on rudimental drums. Inside the wooden Howder's meeting room, the war boss of each tribe bartered with promises of goods and alliances, swaying to the breathing rhythm of the slumbering Squigoth. Their personal knob bodyguards squeezed grips around their axes from opposing corners of the meeting space, eyeing each other up and down and growling deep, chesty rumbles. The war bosses continued to trade and get blind with drink, but the guards were ready, staring each other down with wide yellow eyes. If anything went sour, blood would be spilt. Baishani's face remained contorted as he stared at the monstrous sleeping Squigoth from the wild hill slope that overlooked the orc meeting. Memories of the terror lizards that ruled the plains of Ishan flashed in his mind. He had seen too many die to the hungering teeth of living titans. The pale, bloodied faces of his dead tribesmates, wives and children haunted him now, and he promised that by the morning he would have killed this abomination. For them. Something stirred the giant creature awake. The orcs on its back were no more than flies on a grox, but its animal instincts were set aflame as it sensed the approach of a rival. The need to assert dominance sparking through its primitive brain. It reared up to full height, grinding its front legs into the earth. With a mighty crash it broke through the canopy, challenging the encroaching adversary with echoing, blasting honks and great sprays of sulfuric urine that hosed the jungle behind. Back inside the rocking meeting room, the tension had turned into an overflowing melting pot of gnashing jaws and tensing muscle. Overlapping accusations of betrayal rang from the knobs as they itched to slaughter each other. Only the purple armoured war boss seemed calm, downing a full flagon of moonshine before throwing giant club hands behind its head and sitting back on its chair. It belched and proudly slurred to its host that their tribe could offer something more than edged weapons and strong alcohol if they allied their clans. They could offer a steam-powered war machine. A gargant. A blast of sound, this time mechanical and equally as terrific, countered the Squigoth's calls. Giant vents of boiled steam cooked the air above the tree line, and swathes of trees were felled by the late arrival of the gargant. Ujadak hastily thumbed the pages of his infantry primer, finding the section about the enemies of the Imperium and their titans. The steam-powered gargant was vast in size, but more primitive than the usual orc design. The slapdash bodywork and totem-encrusted armor housed no cannons or zappers, fitted instead with huge bladed arms, a pair of ballistae on each shoulder, a multitude of packed archer and spear thrower platforms, and a flame chucker attached to its ugly steel-toothed head. Oil-stained boiler boys manned the flamethrower, burning a vertical jet of fire into the night, a fierce amber light casting across the jungle meeting and the snapping face of the Saurus. The four hunters checked and rechecked their equipment, looking like animate clay statues with their skin covered in thick brown mud and streaks of camo paint. Kalyan locked in a full cylindrical drum of bullets for his shooter. Songbird slipped on her favorite spiked knuckle dusters and practiced her blade work. Ujalik went through the motions of sighting then dropping the aim on his longlaz and carbine, switching between the two and feeling the weight of the weapons and the surging adrenaline in his blood. Baishani countered the stick bombs and smoke grenades on his chest harness before rolling his shoulders and working out the stiffness in the joints with lightning fast shadow boxed uppercuts and close combat routines. They knew the plan. Sergeant Kalyan had versed them well in the art of war and violence, and what was to come this night. The orcs were drunk, tired, and unprepared. They had made this jungle their home, but it did not belong to them. Armageddon belonged to the Imperium of Man, and they all had to die. Four orc hunters against a conclave of greenskin tribes, a Saurus, and a Gargant. Good odds. The orc war bosses laughed on top of the howder, looking down on their clans gathering together and celebrating the steam-powered titan that had come to a stop at the edge of the meeting. A thousand swarming Gretchen covered the machine like foul green termites, hanging and swinging from the welded plates on the armor and cheering to their boss who thrust a heavy axe up in salute. The hunters silently descended the slope, 
tall, leafy foliage covering their movement whilst they maneuvered to the now sparsely populated outskirts of the meeting. The group stopped when two greenskins drunkenly began to push through the foliage to their side. They felt the siblings' blades when they emerged from the bush, dispatched in quick, violent assassination when the long knives smashed and turned through their windpipes. Songbird and Baishani each cut a grim trophy from the orc corpses before heaving the stinking bodies into the undergrowth. Their necklaces would be full with gracious offerings to the Sky Father by the time morning comes. As if in response to the small token of bloody orc ears that dangled from their beaded jewelry, a cloud of fog swept through the jungle. The Emperor protects and hides us, thanked Ujadak as the creeping mist began to settle around them. They moved like ghosts inside the blanket of fog, striking from the cover of darkness and swirling vapour whenever an orc wandered too far from its tribe. Crying Gretchen scouts were grabbed from behind and stomped to wreckages of blood and bone, their screams unheard over the steam gargant's boiling engines and resounding roars of the squiggoth. The four hunters sliced and gouged. They hacked and mauled, tore and smashed. They butchered a bloody path to the shadow of the Saurus and readied their grapple launchers. Upon its throne at the bow of the giant beast, a pig dock growled to its subordinates. They heaved hard on the giant leashing chains that hung tightly over the Saurus's face. The metal rings that looped through the sides of its tusked maw pulled taut, rearing its head and re-established control over the bellowing monster. The pig dock leaned forwards on its throne and sneered at the sight of the metal monstrosity that stood opposite its beautiful animal. A frothing hatred broiled within the orc, its feral mind consumed by the thoughts of the gloating gangs of boiler boys inside the gargant. The war bosses crashed their grog together. The knob guards still stared wildly with murderous intent. The drumming on the upper decks of the howder resumed, the orc's primal rhythms filling the night. A wild boy, dazed and confused with a belly full of booze, staggered towards something shining at the aft of the empty landing deck. It tried to grab at the glinting forked metal, failing spectacularly with its feral brain clouded with alcohol and double vision. It couldn't hold the churning drink in its gut anymore and retched noisily over the lip of the decking. Leaning forward to watch the brown chunks of puke fall a hundred meters to the ground, a muscled, mud-coated arm swung from underneath the wooden lip, caught a grip on the orc's vomit-sodden jerkin, and pitched the greenskin from the deck. The wild boy flailed as it fell, disappearing into the sheet of settled fog. Songbird smiled with ugly, sharpened teeth to her brother, whilst they hung from their lines, both finding humor in her kill. With a nod. They both ascended over their grapple hooks. The siblings moved fast across the empty deck, hunkering down behind a stash of hand weapons and spears just before two more wild boys made their way down the stilted steps that separated the first and second floor. They barked, calling out for their tribe mate who had unknowingly landed on the jungle floor like a burst fruit. Songbird was eager to kill, her quickening heart pumping rivers of adrenal blood to her fibrous muscles. She shifted in readiness to break cover and attack, but Baishani rested a large hand on her shoulder and squeezed. They couldn't afford to make any mistakes. The orcs were stupid, untrained creatures, but there were many. They waited, watching the two feral greenskins stomp by their position behind the weapon crates and nearing the stern of the deck. Baishani gestured with his two palms clasped together in pseudo prayer sign before lifting them slowly, cutting the air with his fingertips. Using the intensifying drums on the upper decks to cover their movement, the siblings slowly reached into the cluttered weapons box, each taking a long spear. There was no better time. They javelined the spears at the two wild boys, Baishani studying into the skull of his target, killing it instantly. Songbirds landing in the shoulder of hers, punching through and lodging halfway into the meat. The wounded wild boy gripped the tip of the spear and pulled it messily through his body spinning to face them both with giant inflamed eyes and a slavering mouth full of yellow tusks. There was a look in that orc's face that reminded Songbird of a rabid, brain-diseased animal. The gaping wound did nothing to slow the creature down as it rushed the hunters with a spiked club swinging. Songbird ducked under the orc's double-handed swing, the weapon's nailed spikes lodging inside a stack of crates. With spitting fury, 
The beast ripped his weapon free of the splintering wood and continued to chase the siblings with wide, sweeping reaches of its club. The decking shook with the thunderous drums above. Baishani parried a wild blow with his scalper, but the orc followed with a devastating punch to the ribs. The hunter fell to a knee, gasping for precious air, the wind ripped from his lungs by the blow. Songbird blindsided the wild boy with a hard shoulder barge, knocking it off balance, but not off its feet. The crazed orc struck out with fist and club, but Songbird was too fast, slipping a hooking punch and delivering her own. The spiked brass knuckles indented the creature's pig snout and lacerated its face, loose flaps of pitted skin peeling from its cheeks as she pulled her fist away. She loaded up and drove the edge knuckles back into its eye. It popped like a fleshy red grape. In a desperate, blinded attempt to take her with it in death, the orc elevated its weapon, but the thick arm was cut from the elbow as Baishani found his breath and locked it off with his blade. Songbird chopped into the wild boy's temple, and the frothing orc died on its knees. Kalyan stood back on the Saurus's hide and hauled himself up his grapple line, his old muscles and joints straining, beginning to feel the building lactic burn as he neared the top. He suddenly felt the line begin to shake in his hands. Looking up, he saw a lone Gretchen perched near the grappling hook, cutting through the rope with a serrated stone blade. Kalyan felt his tired shoulders start to give as he hurried to climb, the rope quickly fraying from the Gretchen's frantic soaring. A whistling lasbolt seared from afar, bursting through the Gretchen's wide grinned face and scorching a dark patch into the armoured plates of the Squigoth. Ujarek lowered his long las, watching the body of the Gretchen fall from his vantage point on the cliffside. He readjusted the scope and settled his cheek back onto the stock rest. Kalyan whispered a prayer to the guiding spirits and his huntmate's blessed marksmanship before he finished the ascent, rolling over the edge of the howder and racking his shooter. Above him in one of the enclosed stairwell entrances to the second level, he heard the grunting of orcs five to six in number. It sounded like an argument within the small room, all unintelligible shouts and sounds. But then again, Kalyan thought, they always sounded like this. The guttural exchange of words turned to violence as Kalyan heard the orcs grapple and slam one another into the entrance walls. He unclipped a frag grenade from his belt, pulled the pin, and lobbed it up into the stairwell. The giant orc bodies muffled the noise of the explosion, yet the booming clatter of Kalyan's shooter tearing up the stairs and into the shell-shocked orcs more than made up for it. He stood above the crawling orcs, pressing the smoking gun's barrel into each bleeding body before pulling the trigger huge entry wounds rupturing over their flesh. Kalyan looked up from the pile of executed corpses to face a wall of green muscle, gnashing teeth and chopper blades. The entire level was filled with staring orcs and screeching Gretchen. He raised the shooter to his hip and unloaded. From the opposite end of the decking, the siblings heard the thundering roar of Kalyan's weapon and understood the plan was in motion. They rushed towards the second level and up the stilted steps, the path cleared by Kalyan's diversion. The entire second level was trying to rip the old hunter to pieces when the siblings entered the floor. Heavy rounds from the hunter's gun cut through the charging orcs, dropping them on top of one another. The siblings could see the third level stairwell was free, their route to the control chains open. Kalyan's weapon stopped firing and Songbird witnessed with a panic realization that his gun had jammed or run dry, and was now fighting with only the shooter's jagged bayonet, thrusting the bolted curved knife into his attackers. Laz bolts traced from the cliffside, slicing through green flesh and splintering the surroundings, yet the orcs pressed forwards towards Kalyan, their numbers and bloodlust too great. Songbird turned to her brother with unfamiliar tears in her almond-shaped eyes. She looked vulnerable with a sadness her brother was not accustomed to. She pressed her forehead against his. Pulling away sharply, she pushed by Shani hard towards the stairwell, gesturing for him to go before turning away and screaming the war cry of Ishun. The meeting table splintered as the purple armored knob smashed its heavy axe through the wood. The sound of the barking shooter and an archic fight happening outside the room meant negotiations had officially ended. It got its lingering wish for violence as the opposing tribe's knob careened across the room and tackled it through the door. 
Their axes went spiraling away as the two monstrous greenskins rolled on the deck, vying for a mounted position and driving armored headbutts into one another that cracked, dented, and bloodied with every blow. The war bosses crashed next from the broken doorway, stabbing and biting, following the scent of carnage. A whirlwind of madness and confusion swept throughout the entirety of the platform as the two warring bosses and their guards continued to punish each other with bone-snapping strikes. The two tribes looked at each other with escalating distrust and fury before the war began. A war that hit the movement of Baishani as he skulked up towards the third level. More destructive impacts as Kalyan heaved all of his frags into the mass of infighting orcs. His empty shooter lay discarded in the archway, replaced with his scalper and tomahawk crossed across his chest. He smiled at the thought of meeting his ancestors soon calling upon their guiding strength one final time. Like a gore-soaked demon of war, Songbird used all of her training to advance towards Kalyan's position. Her blade work beautiful in its precision and brutal power. Her steps and parry savage perfection. She used her enemy's momentum and anger against them, pivoting to avoid death blows and sending the assailants tumbling into each other and over the deck to their demise. She used her bladed knuckle dusters to punch out throats and pierce arterial veins that spouted geezers of red blood. More Laz fire pierced the darkness, and a heavy orc tumbled back, the weapon that was inches away from being buried in Songbird's head, falling from its dead hand. The deck had become slippery with the blood and entrails from the hunter's work, mixed with the products of the tribal war violence that raged around them. Songbird felt a sting of pain as something impacted into her shoulder, then two more brief pangs of agony in her thigh. She looked up to see Gretchen archers tied around sprouting flag masts, re-knocking their small bows and shouting for their boss's attention. She tore the thin shafts from her skin and rolled to a stack of pallets as another hail of short arrows thudded into the deck around her feet. Using a pallet as a shield, Songbird pressed forward, feeling the projectiles thudding into the wood while she ran. Kalyan held his Ishan short axe towards the purple armored knob, singling the creature out for mortal combat. The orc brute had taken the life of its rival, a dripping armored head gripped tightly in its hand. It howled with anger at the human that dared to challenge it so openly. Kalyan beat the axe handle across his boned breastplate and walked to meet his fate. The brute hurled the disembodied head at the walking warrior, blood from the spinning neck stump spattering across Kalyan's face as it sailed past him. The old warrior smeared the red blood under his eyes and down over his lips in thick, fingered lines, his axe still upright and pointed at the hulking terror. He waited for the green skin to strike, weaving under the first attack and stabbing a scalper up into the exposed armpit, tearing the weapon through the flesh in a quick, puncturing move. The knob just stared at the protruding blade and swung his brutal axe in response. Kalyan let go of the wedge scalper and crouched under the swing cracking his short-handled axe into the orc's naked heel as he slid underneath the brute's bowed legs. A turning swing nearly took Kalyan's head clean off his shoulders, but only opened up the other leg for attack. The orc's kneecap burst open when the old hunter's axe hit home. The giant orc collapsed onto its ruined knee, and Kalyan wrapped himself around the back of the monster, his thudding axe opening a widening gash in the green-skinned champion's chest. Pumping viscera flowed from the deep cuts and from between the orc's teeth as it struggled to breathe with a throat full of rising blood. Kalyan swung around the body, arcing underneath the creature and pulling the scalper free before delivering a spinning strike with the knife that removed the orc's gargling head. Emotionless, Kalyan crossed his weapons across his chest. He felt his breathing slow, smelled the enemy's drying blood on his armor and gave a blessing to the almighty Sky Father and the spirits that guide. With a sudden explosion of force and gore, Kalyan's ribcage burst outwards, his weapons falling from his hands as he was lifted upwards by the war boss's enormous sword. The dying hunter was brought close to the boss's grimacing face and the squawking squig mimic that hungrily perched on its shoulder. They took turns to eat the meat and bones from his skull. Songbird watched with all the seething pain and anger of a cornate berserker burning through her soul. Her brethren, her war chief, had been cut down from behind and feasted on like lowly gay meat. That was not a warrior's death. 
A scream burst from her unclenching mouth that demanded bloodshed and vengeance. The laughing war boss was happy to allow her that chance. On the highest level of the howder, the pig dog cowered from the commotion in the corner of his throne room, its stupefied servants bound to the giant control chains, heaving back to keep the giant saurus from moving. Something chimed across the floor in a bouncing tinkle of metal that made all of the orc slaves turn as one. A bilious white cloud poured from circular vents on Baishani's smoke grenade, and the death cries of the orc servants rang out as they were pierced and gutted from the warrior in the smoke. Their dead bodies slumped forward, and the chain slackened, allowing the saurus to lower its gargantuan head. The entire howder listed like a capsizing ship as the mighty beast re-established its contest with the gargant. The creature only responded to two attack commands. Chains tight to stop. Chains loose to kill. From the cliffside, Ujarek watched the Saurus crash tusk first into the Gargant, the great collision shaking the rock face underneath him and leaving a green smear of a thousand Gretchen's remains on the armoured plating of the steam machine. He winced when the Gargant's flamethrower spat an oily stream of bright fire into the face of the rampaging creature. A blaze began to spread across the Howder's decking and masts, cooking the Gretchen archers alive whilst they struggled to free themselves. The Saurus lowered its head to avoid the torrent of flame and rammed its tusks into the machine again, tearing into the metal belly and gouging enormous holes into the plates with a ravaging fury. Ujalik desperately tried to pinpoint his fellow hunters through his rifle scope, whilst bolts catapulted from the Gargant's ballistae speared into the Saurus's hide. Vents of steam whistled into the sky as boiler power was directed to the bladed arms. A section of flaming howder disintegrating as the machine's appendages crashed across the decking and smashed a path through all three levels before meeting the thick plated hide of the saurus. The wooden howder was falling apart rapidly from the crushing impacts of the blades and the monster's own erratic movements. A wave of scrambling greenskins tumbled and fell to their death when another area of flaming decking cracked apart and slid away from the Saurus's back. Ujarek yelped with joy when he found Songbird through the firestorm, fighting like a devil with the very flames of hell licking at her feet. He trained the scope on the battle, and his heart sank when he noticed the faceless broken body of Sergeant Kalyan. Songbird had forgone any finesse in her fighting now, messy, double-handed strikes replacing the measured parries and attacks. Ujarek cheered as he watched the greenskin's fingers separate from its sword hand, Songbird's blade hacking through its defense. The sniper lost his bead on his battle sister as the Saurus charged again, this time locking its tusks inside the Gargant's internal scaffolding and thrusting forward, forcing the metal monster to squeal in protest as its treads span in retaliation. The titan of flesh and tusk, with its hide pierced with spears and burnt with flame, was winning this struggle. Ujalik scoped to the top level and saw Baishani butchering the cowering pig dock into chunks of quivering meat before scaling down the control chain until he was level with the Saurus's eye. He jammed his blade into the beady pupil of the monster and a black soup poured from the wound. The Saurus roared in pain and pushed deeper into the machine, the hunter nearly consumed by the creature as the loose chain swung in precariously close to its snapping teeth. The Gargant was being moved backwards under the untamed force of the Squigoth, earth and foliage of the jungle churning under its treads before the debris turned to the spitting stone of the fast approaching cliff face. Ujalik quickly scoped back to Songbird and her fight with the war boss on the second deck. She still stood, but a stump that used to be her fighting arm retched dark blood across the deck, the orc boss holding the limb in its good hand. Ujalik lined up the long lad's crosshairs on the boss and squeezed on the heavy trigger, emptying the power pack at his lumbering target. Ujalik's aim was the truest in the regiment, but every shot missed the creature that swatted at Songbird with her own arm. Fate and the gods had decided that this battle was not to be settled with shot, but with blade and blood. With the high-pitched battle cry of the Ishanites, Baishani leapt from the flaming deck above, landing beside the war boss and immediately slashing at the orc's face with his scalper. Black blood from the Saurus's eye fluid dripping from the edge. The weight of Songbird crashed into the war boss when its aggression was focused on her brother. Sharpened fangs bit into the orc's throat as Songbird latched on, tearing at the meat like a hungry dog. 
The rampaging war boss twisted and thrashed to release the hunter from its neck, Songbird's grip slackening as flesh tore away, sending her spinning through the air to land next to Kalyan's corpse. Baishani wrapped an arm around the war boss's bleeding neck from behind and thumped his long knife into the top of its spine, dragging the wicked blade to the bottom of its splitting back. A second blade punctured the orc's extended gut and began to slowly pull upwards towards the gullet. Songbird stood in front of the war boss, defiantly looking into its rolling eyes with Kalyan's scalper ripping up into muscle and bowel. The siblings wrenched their blades from the orc at the same time, and disgusting, slithering organs slopped from the front and back. Ujarek cried out in exultation when the war boss slammed to the decking, but his joy quickly turned to bottoming despair when the gargant finally tipped over the cliff's ledge and began to drag the attached saurus with it. He recited through the scope. Songbird and Baishani knelt beside their fallen sergeant, the brother holding his pale sister upright to keep her from falling unconscious. Baishani made an aquiline gesture for the Sky Father who delivered them from their dying world and gave them purpose. He rested a hand on Kalyan's chest and kissed the forehead of his dead sister. The faces of his children smiled and welcomed him to the next great journey. The Gargant and Saurus fell from the mighty cliffside and the hungering jungle of Armageddon opened her jaws and swallowed them whole. The eagle called from burning skies, for Ishan born and spirit guides, to learn the jungle and to die, to live beside our father's side. For those who fell before this day, hear our song and marching feet, and dance with us where you may lay, for soon I pray we all shall meet. Flick on the safety, flick off the juice, then you can pull the power pack loose. Pop out the bolt, unhook the grip, put pressure on the barrel and out it will slip. Remove the coils and scour them clean, then wipe the ore specs till you've made it gleam. Oil the rails, turn the screws, then run your fingers over the grooves. Only after you've scrubbed every piece, part and grain, can you throw your hands in reverse and put it together again. The old rhyme went through my head, the way it always did when I took apart a weapon. My grandfather taught it to me and my sister when we were still years shy of becoming white shields, and our brains were soft enough that it just got lodged in there. It didn't matter where I was, or what was going on. The old man's voice was always ringing in my ears. As I moved from my rifle to my sidearm, an old auto pistol that I'd kept in my duffel for years, I thought back to those days, looking up at the towering emplacements and the sweeping battlements, the ugly, brutish hard points, and thinking how strong they looked just like the old man's hands whenever they taught me one of his tricks. They were old and scarred, but they looked like they'd stand forever. It wasn't until I grew up that I realized just how frail they actually were. It didn't scare me finding that out. It lit my fire, as he said. It meant I was going to have to do more, be more. So I ran further, pushed up faster, swung harder, and shot straighter. Most important, when somebody knocked me down, I got up, and I got up quick. On the ground is no place to be when you're in a fight, and when you were born on Cadia, you were always in a fight. Even if you couldn't see it at that precise moment. I had a shot, and I took it. Notations for marksmanship exceeded expectations on physical trials, 
and I managed to make it past the psych battery. I made my first jump with the grav chute, even though I nearly pissed myself. After the fifth, I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. When the time for trials came around, I was on the line with everyone else who wanted the right to call themselves Kazakin. I wanted it more than anyone else there. Wanting something doesn't mean you get it though, and that's a bitter bite to take. I didn't wash out. According to my official jacket, I got stamped with something called Tempest Diende. My high gothic is shit, but the designation mostly meant I was right on the line. All it would have taken was one person getting sick, getting slapped with insubordination, or missing a step, and I would have been in their place. I got sent back to my unit with a salute and a well done from the commissar who ran the selection process. It was the only praise he'd given me, and I had no idea what I was supposed to do with it. I'd earned a short leave to put myself back together, and I spent most of it drinking a cocktail primarily used in the motor pool for lubing tank treads. I didn't have some kind of epiphany that made me realize my true purpose. I didn't hear any dark whispers coming out of the void. I just drank till I puked, slept until I couldn't any more, then picked myself up and got back on the firing line. There was still work to do. I got promoted, then promoted again. Not because I was the best there, or because I had some special insight, but because I knew how to show my troops how to do something. Sometimes I only had to show them once, and sometimes I had to go through it a half a dozen times, but they always got it in the end. When part of my regiment got sent off world to offer airborne support to a world that had been hit by a rock, we were all too happy for the chance to fly. Even after an engine malfunction that led to a crash landing where we found ourselves in hostile territory surrounded by hordes of greenskins, we still had a job to do. Our V-Birds made it in one piece, as did most of our jump gear, and we were good to go. I made a dozen air assaults on that posting. Every one of them passed speed freaks juiced out of their minds on going fast with my team following along behind like raptors on the hunt. I picked up two commendations and a dozen scars, and the hordes charged to fill the world broke. There were still orcs. There would probably always be orcs now, but we'd helped hammer them back underground for the time being. I was in the med center when the message came about the assault on Cadia. All able-bodied troopers were being recalled. I tried to go with, and the captain told me if I could get out of the cot and walk to the bird under my own power, that I was free to ride with them to the fight. I made it to my feet, and out into the plaza. I had one step to go before my legs gave out, and I crumbled. I don't remember being carried back into the center, but by the time I was coherent again, I was told my unit had left. The medic patted my shoulder and smiled at me. She told me Cadia had stood for centuries before I'd been born, and whatever came out of the eye this time would break. Just like all the times before. I wish she'd been right. Holy throne do I wish that. I didn't believe it when I heard. Despite the red chaos washing over the sky and the reports of madness throughout our area, I couldn't believe it. Every bastion I'd ever walked, and every wall that had stood sentinel was gone. Guns that had fired for centuries, that had turned back black crusades that would have smashed any other world, fell silent. The gates of hell had been kicked open from the inside and the darkness that had been held in check was spilling across the stars like overturned ink, seeping into every corner it could reach. If I'd been a grenadier, 
I would have been on the planet when it broke. If I'd been a little faster, I would have dodged the wound I'd taken. If I'd been a little slower, it would have killed me. If I'd been a little tougher, I'd have been there. Almost. The word echoed in my head like the crack of a bolt pistol. Almost. 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 The light was fading, but it wasn't gone yet. I checked my magazine and holstered my sidearm. I slapped the power pack back into my rifle and slung it over my shoulder. Transport was leaving in half an hour, and I had a berth to fill. The enemy thought their victory was within their grasp. They almost had it. I had one more lesson to teach them. Almost wasn't good enough. Commissar Crassus was not required to concern himself with the nature of his orders. His job was to enforce them, and by the Emperor he would do that. The fact that the governor he was charged with protecting had turned to chaos was not his concern. If Valor Adressis was now a traitor, so be it. Though Crassus would rather have her killed, he had strict orders to return her alive, and for as long as he could remember, he had dedicated himself to enacting orders. The Deltic Gorgons understood him before he'd finished the sentence. It was a rare day when they had to be told twice to do something. The Catachans, however, were a miserable lot at the best of times. That he had to kill two of them to reinforce a point was to their dishonor, and a use of resources that he could scarcely afford. He'd used up most of his plasma pistol's recharges already against the Tyranids. Commissar! Came a Vox message. It was Tempesta Prime Cadmer. The tunneling creature is dead. Slate Monotron reports suggest two more beneath the quadrangle. Exits are four, two, four, northwest. Proceed. The difference, Crassus thought, between the Tempesta Prime and the milling Catachans was there in that one message. Efficiency. Clarity and a plan for getting out of this hellhole as quickly as possible. Proceed, Gorgon. Crassus turned to the squads of nerve-shattered soldiers crouched within the corridors of the quadrangle. Right, you lot. We're going out that door. I'll lead. He added a final comment. Let's see if you can kill more of those creatures than I do this time. Wound up. And finally, full of proper aggression, the Catachans followed him through the rubble-strewn passage. That they were itching to kill him was fine. So long as their fury was directed at the Tyranids, he might finally get this mission completed. At that moment, another beast burst up ahead of them, shaking the compound and sending debris clattering against the walls in clouds of ash. Another explosion came from behind the Catachans and yet another Tyranid monster rose up from underneath the palace. This time, dozens of smaller fiends emptied out around them. Crassus drew his power sword and screamed for the Catachans to open fire. Lasgun fire burst through Chiton, hurling Xenos to the ground and sending shards of shrapnel skimming through the corridors. Crassus leapt through the darkness, skewering anything that moved and firing his plasma pistol into the swarm. Tempesta Prime Cadma kicked down one of the side doors. Scions emptied into the confines and pressing against the wall filtered down towards him. It was only then that Crassus noticed the strange symbols daubed on the walls in blood. The corrupted icons painted by a corrupted governor. Exit Corridor 4 is clear, but you'll need to fight through creatures in Sector Alpha 4 first. Cadmer boxed. Do we have your permission to secure your exit, Commissar? 
Crassus fired at another lurching form incessantly, burning through the thing's carapace before replying. You do? The Scions with the Governor are to follow us and keep her controlled. You cover the Catachans. I've got them functioning properly now. Sir! With that, Cadmer led his mag-booted Scions back through the side corridor, their monoscopes piercing the clouds of smoke. The next thing that Crassus heard was hotshot weaponry boring through Chiton and the screech of Xenos things dying in large numbers. It was a beautiful sound. There was a spirited determination about the Catachans now. Crassus waved for them to follow through a corridor teeming with Tyranid creatures, and the Astra Militarum soldiers began to impress Crassus with their bold attacks. Red lines of lasgun fire brought down the darting creatures in the distance, and those close up were savaged by quick Catachan blade work and the sheer bloody-minded will to kill. When their knives became lodged in alien carcasses or were swallowed by gaping moors, the Catachans smashed back with bare fists or the butts of their lasguns. The casualties were horrendous, and those soldiers who were mauled amongst the flood of teeth and claws screamed out their rage and agony, but it was a defiant sound one that drove the remaining warriors onwards. Why, Crassus thought, couldn't they fight like this earlier? The walls and floors became thick with bodies, but as they fought through to the exit corridor, the Commissar saw only another Imperial victory. After checking that the Governor was still alive and in the Scion's control, he boxed his location through to Cadma and called for the rest of the 99th Delta Gorgons to follow them out of the compound. Leave your explosives, he added, and get out of there. Araga stood upon the crest of the hill, leaning on his spear staff and looked out across the savannah. The rolling grassland stretched for kilometers in every direction, a yellow sea swaying gently in the wind, broken only by the occasional tree or rocky outcrop. On the horizon, he could make out the darker green of the jungle canopy. The tribesman took out a red-coloured root from an animal skin pouch around his neck and began to chew it. As he crushed the root between his teeth, he felt its juices spreading their effect across his body, loosening the ties between mortal flesh and spirit. His limbs began to go numb, and he felt his mind ready itself for the journey to the world of the gods. He looked vaguely up into the yellow sky, his gaze attracted by movement. From out of the heavens dropped a star, rapidly falling towards Araga, straight as an arrow towards the ridge. This was an omen, but Araga was not sure if it was good or ill. For almost a hundred heartbeats, the tribesmen watched the object growing larger and larger, until it impacted into the ground at the base of the hill in a shower of mud and dust. It looked like a gigantic egg, made of thick leathery skin and ribbed bone plates. As Araga watched, the egg cracked open, its upper half peeling apart like a grotesque flower. There was a spray of purplish ichor, and a large gangling shape flopped from the star egg onto the ground. The shape stretched itself up to its full height, the fluids of its cocoon dripping from its body. It was over twice Araga's height, and as it stood on two thick legs, it unfolded four upper limbs, two of them wicked-looking claws, over a man's height and length. Its purplish flesh was protected by overlapping chitinous plates, and powerful muscle and sinew rippled under its dark skin. Araga's heart began beating faster and faster, and he felt cold sweat prickling all over his body, making him shiver uncontrollably as the creature looked around, seeming to sniff the air. With a sudden snap of its monstrous insect head, 
the beast fixed its hellish glare on Araga, snaring him in the gaze of its red eyes. With a pace startling for its size, the star beast bounded up the slope, its forelimbs ripping at the earth to increase its speed. Araga found himself transfixed, unable to move or shout. He realized this must be one of the creatures from beyond the void which the newcomers had warned his people about, a predator from beyond the distant stars which had come for his soul. As the monster sped towards him, Araga felt something nagging at the back of his mind and realized he could hear a rumbling from off to his right. He wanted to look, but could not tear his eyes away from the demon of destruction racing towards him. The creature was only a few great strides away from Araga, its claws arching back to deliver the killing attack. Without warning, a lightning storm of light lashed into the void demon, blasting it sprawling to the ground, its limbs flailing wildly. Snapped out of the beast's hypnotic spell, Araga spanned to see metal creatures advancing along the ridge, spitting fire at the monstrous intruder. The sky spirits had arrived to save him. The last chances. Deliverance. The native just keeps on staring dumbly at us as we open fire again. I guess it ain't that surprising, considering that these guys are simple mono-edge knife as a creation of the gods. Dumb locals. If they weren't so stupid, they'd be able to fend for themselves, and we wouldn't be here risking our necks to protect them. My attention's distracted away from him when the Lictor gets to its feet again, and the Chimeras have to fire another volley into the creature. I order the rest of the platoon to take up firing positions, keeping up a steady stream of las bolts as we advance. The Lictor then leaps at Frank's squad, but even as it races towards them, hissing like some damned Averan Cobra, they tear it apart with their las guns and heavy bolter. It kind of collapses in on itself, those huge killing claws folding over its body. I walk up to make sure it's truly dead. You can never tell with these fragging tyranids. Some of them have got powers of regeneration you wouldn't believe. Its dark blood is spattered all over the thin grass, and it certainly looks like a corpse. To make sure, I level my last pistol at its head and fire six shots. Okay, last chances! I call to my platoon. Mount up and move out! Some of them begin to walk back to the Chimera transports, but Franks, Letts, and some others walk over to where I'm standing. It's Letts who speaks first. What you been thinking, Cage? We've got the perfect opportunity here. I mean, we got a great chance to get the hell out of this fragging outfit, once and for all. I look at them, not knowing what they mean. What have you got in mind? Well, Frank says, it's two leagues to the jungles. The Colonel would never find us in there. And there's plenty of food to forage, shelter, everything we need to survive. We just have to turn the Chimera south and we're free men again. His eyes are intense now beneath his thick curls of hair. And he takes another step forward Think of it, he continues. No more last chances. No more fragging suicide missions for the Colonel. No more spending every minute wondering what of a thousand kinds of hell we're gonna end up in next. Free men, Lieutenant. Free men. I can hardly believe it. I've been fighting with Franks for a year, and Letts has been with the 13th Penal Legion for twice as long. Like me. Like all the Last Chancers, they were thrown out of their regular units for breaking the Imperial Guard's rules in a big way. To serve the rest of their lives in a penal legion. We've walked across a dozen battlefields together, in the worst fighting you can imagine. We've been through them all. Suicide assaults, rear guard actions, and any other no-hope situation you can think of. It takes more than guts and brawn to survive for that long. And I can't believe they're being so stupid now. What kind of fragging scheme is that? I snap, and their jaws drop. 
Frank starts getting angry, and I can see the blood rushing to his face. He's gonna start trouble if I don't do something right now. Look, boys, I say, trying to calm them down. You haven't thought this through, really. There's a Tyranid hive ship up there, full of specially evolved killing machines. All hungering to eat you up as soon as look at you. The only reason the sky isn't full of mycetic spores yet is because we've managed to pick off the lictors before they found deliverance, so they ain't sure where to commit their forces. But it's just a stalling action, because we can't get them all. No way. And even if we could, as soon as they find out there's more Imperial transports on the way, they'll send every bio-engineered little fragger they've got onto the planet. So the way I see it, you've got two choices. There's your plan, which means hanging around in the open. I know it's jungle, but they'll still find you when they come down. And then what kind of chance are you going to have? Or you can come back with me to Deliverance, where there's a big wall to hide behind. 300 more last chances, the Battle Sisters, and 2,000 natives to help us fight. Your choice, but if you ain't going my way, I'm gonna have to insist you go on foot. The Colonel would skin me if I let you take the Chimeras. It's only midday, so you got eight hours walking till sundown. Plenty of time for you to hole up and wait for the damn Tyranids to come. I see realization drawing on their faces, like the sun breaking out from behind a cloud. I thought I taught them better than this, but it just goes to show that some people never learn anything, unless they get taught the hard way. Unfortunately, when you're in the last chances, most people who learn the hard way are food for the worms. They don't say anything. They just turn around and start walking back to the Chimeras. I take one last look at the Lictor just to be safe. It's strange, because any other type of cadaver would be crawling with flesh ants on this damn planet by now, and there'd be a flock of carrion birds circling overhead. But there's nothing. Not even the bugs will touch a Tyranid. Frag. Of all the things in this galaxy, those fraggers make my skin crawl the most. So we finish the fire sweep, and I'm back in deliverance, debriefing with the Colonel in the Central Keep. I can see the rest of the missionary station out of the window, the mid-afternoon sun blazing down fiercely. It's not big, little more than a large village really, half a mile across with a large central compound, some scattered buildings, and of course this keep, which doubles as an ecclesiarchy shrine. I can see the men walking sentry on the curtain wall, and even at this distance I reckon I can feel their tension. Cage! Colonel Schaefer barks, and I snap back from the outside world. There's him, me, and the other two lieutenants, Green and Cronin. As I was saying, the Colonel continues pointedly. We've had a contact with the relief force. They are no more than two days away. If we can hold for just 48 hours, there will be two whole regiments of Imperial Guard. The wall should be fairly straightforward to defend. It is 18 feet high, so we just have to worry about their hormigons and lictors leaping straight up it. The others we can pick off as they climb up the walls. That leaves only the gate, but that is flanked by two towers with emplaced auto cannons, and we can park a chimera behind the gates themselves to make it harder to force. Any questions? Crowden clears his throat nervously and wipes a hand through the thin hair plastered across his scalp. He's a skinny man, kind of jittery in my experience. Emperor alone knows how he had the guts to have his squad incinerate an Imperial temple after stealing the artifacts inside. Even more of a surprise is that the Ecclesiarchy didn't demand his head on a pole and his entrails decorating the roadway. What about gargoyle, sir? Cronin asks. No problem. The colonel assures us. He's ice cold, as usual. As calm as if we weren't going to be fighting for our damn lives in a few days. Perhaps even in the next few hours. As always, he's wearing his full dress uniform, 
clean shaven like he was fresh out of the barracks. He's a big man, physically I mean, but there's more to him than that. Those cold blue eyes and his own force of will make him seem twice as tall as anyone around. I wouldn't call it charisma, cause he's an uncommunicative and surly man. He just has this sheer presence that fills the room. We have two Hydras, and this keep has four point defense emplacements. If anything tries flying over the walls, we have the firepower to gun them down. In any case, Cage and his platoon are acting as mobile reserve behind the walls. If the Tyranids get a breakthrough at the walls or gates, or we get some unexpected visitors dropping down, he'll move in and bolster the defense. Anything else? I glance out of the window again and see the sunlight glittering off highly polished armor, which makes me think of something. The sisters, what's the deal there? I ask, already knowing the answer. The Adeptus Sororitas are under Ministorum authority, so we have no direct control over their actions. I have spoken to the Sister Superior in charge and outlined our plan. I'm sure they'll play their part. The same applies to the levies. They'll be manning the walls, and we will concentrate our guns around the gatehouse. That is where the fighting will be fiercest. If you need to see me, that's where you'll find me. No surprise there then. The Colonel is always in the roughest of the fighting, and he always walks out too. Emperor alone knows what makes him do it. We're here because we did wrong and got caught. But him? What did he do wrong? I mean, what kind of man would choose to lead an Imperial Guard Penal Legion? What kind of mind do you need to walk into so many situations where you must be blessed by the Emperor to ever take another breath again, and then march straight out and into the next one? He must be mad. I mean seriously insane. They say he spends his time on board ship practicing ways to kill himself in the event that he's wounded. I take it back about the Tyranids. There are some things which are a hell of a lot more scary, because they're in human form. That's what they say he is, a devil in human form. And when he's ready for a fight like now, and you look into his eyes like I'm doing now, you can believe it. It's about noon the day after, and the Tyranids have found us. Maybe a lictor slipped through the net, which wouldn't be surprising. Considering that for a big brute, they can be really sneaky. They can sniff you out ten miles downwind, and they're covered in scales which shift colour so that you can't see them. Or maybe the Nids just got fed up with waiting, and decided to come and get us wherever we are. I stood on the wall last night, and watched the spores dropping down. Scary sight, believe me. It was like ten meteor storms all at once. These falling stars coming down, wave after wave of them. There's an old saying, if you see a shooting star, you can offer a prayer to the Emperor and he'll grant it. Well, with all of those flaming stars, that's one hell of a lot of prayers to be delivered on. But I decided to use them all in one go, for one big, huge prayer to the Emperor. Do you want to know what I prayed for? I prayed that those shooting stars would stop coming down but they didn't. So I guess a murderer like me hasn't got the right to pray to the Emperor anymore, which is why I'm here fighting now, serving him in the only way I know. Frag, being here, in this missionary station with all these ecclesiarchy types, it must be having an effect on me. I mean, I know the Emperor is our Lord and is watching over us, but I've always figured that those of us who can have to watch out for ourselves, cause he's there to watch out for those who can't watch out for themselves. Just like we're here to defend the tribes people from the Tyranids, cause all they got are crappy knives and spears and brave warrior hearts, which is all well and good if you're fighting amongst yourselves, but against the Tyranids it's going to be about as effective as trying to stop a saber shell from blowing you away by holding up your hands. But I guess, when you've stood there for an hour, and watched your doom come down out of the stars in a constant flow. It'll be nice to know if this is the time when it goes wrong, 
and you end up with your guts torn out on a lictor's flesh hooks. Or some hormagon stabs those dagger talons through your chest. It ain't really the end. That there's someone waiting for you, and it wasn't all a waste of time. I know I've got to ditch these morbid thoughts. Got to stay sharp. Otherwise, this is going to be my final trip with the last chances. It's hard, though. So hard. Because I was there on Ikar 4. I saw what they can do to a world. How they fight. There were 6,000 last chances back then. Less than 500 of us made it out. The regular troops I hear lost over a million men defending Ikar 4. There were Titans there. And Space Marines too. If the rumours are true. And even those Eldar turned up. I heard someone say once. All those guns, all those men, and we only just won the fight. I've seen so much blood and guts spilled in my life I don't have nightmares anymore. But if there's one thing that would give me nightmares, it's Tyranids. They're just so different to us. Even Orcs fight for territory and conquest. But the Tyranids, they just consume everything like they're here to wipe out every single living thing in the entire galaxy. And they'll never ever stop until that's done. Which is why I was stood up on the wall last night, in the freezing wind. You'd never guess that it could be so hot in the day and so cold at night, watching them coming down. Watching my doom come, because I've got a seriously bad feeling about this one. The hairs on my neck prickle constantly, and I feel like I'm dead already. It's just my body that's got to catch up with the plan. Which is why I'm standing here, hoping there really is an Emperor, that he listens to our prayers and comes to our aid. But I can't count on that, which is why I'm here now as the sun starts dipping towards the jungles. Ready to fight, like I've never had to fight before. Ready to do anything I can, because death is stalking across those plains right now. The main assault wave has hit the walls. The sun's low on the horizon, and they attack from that direction to blind us. The colonel was right about the gargoyles. Our air defences were more than a match. About a hundred of them came flying in, diving down onto the fort. The guns opened up, blowing them out of the sky. Some managed to get over the walls, and then the hydras got them, firing high explosive shells into the brutes, blasting them apart. That was horrible. Pieces of bloodied and charred meat dropping down on you like obscene hailstones. No time to clear up the mess though, because the rest of the swarm has just arrived. It's hard to tell what's going on from back where we are in reserve, a couple of hundred paces from the wall. We've cleared ourselves a killing zone, demolishing the buildings inside the perimeter and using them to make a readout around the keep, so that if the tyrannies get inside, We've got a second fire in line. Most of the action seems to be going off around the gatehouse, just like the colonel said it would. The men are three ranks deep on the walls on the south side, while the battle sisters are holding the west wall. There's about half as many of the sororitas as there are last chances, but they seem to be holding out better than we are. Then again, give me a bolt gun and power armor, and I'd show you just how mean and nasty a last chancer can get. It's about quarter of an hour since the attack begun when the Tyranids get their first breakthrough. I'm watching the east end of the south wall when I see a horde of termagants running around and I realise there's nobody else up that end anymore. Okay, last chances! Time to die! I bellow as usual and then we're running across the killing ground towards the wall fast as we can. The gunners and the chimeras take the hint and suddenly there's a fusillade of heavy bolter fire and multi-laser shots directed at the termagants. Thirty heart-pounding seconds later, and we're leaping up the steps, snapping off shots with our las guns as we close in. The supporting fire from the chimeras stops as we reach the top, and suddenly I'm surrounded by the creatures. I see one of them leveling its living gun at me, and just manage to take it down before it can fire. All of a sudden, they charge at us, 
and I rip my chainsword from my belt, and I get the blades whirling, while the others make ready with their bayonets. The termagants are biting and clawing at everything at their path, and I'd swear they were mindless, if it wasn't for the coordinated fashion of their attack. As they sweep around me, I feel like I'm going to get washed away in the wave, and panic hits me, bile rising out of my stomach as I see those fanged, nightmarish faces all around me. One of the termagants leaps at me, his four upper limbs drawn back ready to attack, but I bring the chainsword round, and the blades crash through its carapace, sending thick alien blood spattering across my face. It tastes foul, and I'm almost sick with the stench of it. I put a shot through the bulbous head of another one, and then something hits me hard in the back. This thing has latched onto me, and I can't get at it! I feel its claws scrabbling at my flak jacket, hear the material tearing away, and its hot breath is on my neck, a long pointed tongue slithering over my neck. Its jaws latch onto my shoulder, and I try to angle my las pistol round for a shot, desperately trying to rip this beast off of me because I don't want to be killed by some damn termagant. I'm not gonna go like this. Not like this. Before it gets the killing blow in, Trucko is there, one of Frank's squad, his bayonet skewering the termagant, and I feel it let go and drop to the floor. There's no time to thank him though, as he gets thrown to the ground, half his face ripped off by a vicious claw. The creature is hunched over him, all six limbs on the ground ready to spring and its red eyes turn to look up at me. I shoot its legs from beneath it, then drive the chainsword into its soft, unprotected guts. Trucko screaming, wailing his head off. But there's no time to give him peace. No rest for the wicked, as they say. We push him back, inch by bloody inch, to the edge of the wall. I see Franks pick one of them up and hurl it bodily over the parapet, its limbs and tail still flailing around even as it plummets down. I look over the edge of the wall, and I see how they manage to get up. A pile of their body stretches two-thirds of the way up the wall, almost three meters high, body upon body upon body, creating a ramp of corpses for the others to run up. Grenades! Blow those bodies away from the wall! I shout, even as I dodge aside to avoid a barbed tail lashing towards my throat. My chainsaw bites again making an ear-piercing screech as it shrieks through chitinous plates. The others heard me though, and they're tossing frag grenades over the parapet, trying to dislodge the fleshy pile. I see Marshall standing atop the wall, gripping his las rifle by the barrel and swinging it from side to side like a club, battering away at the brood as it scuttles up towards us. The grenades blossom, sending bits of torn flesh flying and something gives. The pile of bodies slides outwards along the walls, falling to the ground, leaving smears of blood along the rockcrete. Then the termagants are falling back, away from the wall. But things aren't over yet. There's something else coming towards us, coming at us real fast. With long, flea-like leaps and bounds, the hormagaunts speed in, almost flying over the litter of corpses leading up to the wall. We're trying to shoot as many of them as possible, as they close in. But there's still twenty, maybe thirty of them, when they get to the base of the wall. They stop there for half a heartbeat, bunching those powerful leg muscles, and then they spring up, clearing the wall by a good two or three feet, those four deadly dagger talons jabbing out. One of them punches its claw into Marshall's shoulder, and he grabs its arm in one hand, holding it close. He wraps his other arm around the throat of another as it tries to push past and then throws himself off the wall, taking them both with him. A serrated claw sweeps up towards my groin, but I manage to get there with my chainsword, lopping off the limb, my las pistol scoring a hit through one of its glassy red eyes. The rest of the fight just blurs into a waking nightmare of hacking and slashing and stabbing and kicking and shooting punching and screaming, bestial faces and hot breath, flailing talons and ripping claws, blood and filth and guts slick across the walkway, a constant fight into your arms are leaden with fatigue and your brain can't process the information anymore. You're just fighting from instinct and nothing else.
We managed to stave off the assault, and as the Tyranids fall back across the plain, a cheer starts up by the gatehouse and spreads along the wall. I let my men cheer along as well, though we've got little to celebrate. The shock of the close call with the termagant is beginning to creep up on me, and I look around for something to do to keep my mind occupied and not thinking about how close I came to going down this time. I see the colonel striding along the walkway towards me, his face as grim as ever. I've never seen him break into a smile, not once. Cage, clear away the dead. I'm sending flamer teams to clear the front of the wall. Then he's gone again, issuing orders, getting the wounded divided into those that can fight and those that need to be given the Emperor's grace. That's it. No thanks. No, well done, Cage. You held the wall. Just more orders. More work. More fighting and dying to be done. I detail some of my men to start throwing the bodies over the parapet and see that the flamer teams are already at work. Jets of fire turning the piles into pyres. I'll leave them to their dirty work and seek out the colonel. I find him outside the keep, talking to Nathaniel, the missionary in charge of the station. They seem to be arguing about something. But these men need treating. You cannot make them fight again, Nathaniel's complaining. If these men cannot fight, they are dead, missionary. We need every single man we can have for the walls. The colonel replies in that low, grating voice of his. It's the first time I've had a chance to get a proper look at him since the fight began. His uniform is soaked in blood, alien and human, but none of it appears to be his. There's not a scratch on his skin, not a fragging scratch. My spine goes to ice, and I try not to think about it. Nathaniel's still arguing, but the colonel holds up his hand to stop him. These men do not deserve your pity. He says, his eyes flashing like sun on ice. They are thieves, murderers, looters, rapists, insubordinates, and heretics. Every sin you can conceive of has been committed by at least one man here. More than that, they are traitors. They once served as free men in the Great Imperial Army, but they betrayed the trust placed in them by the Emperor and his servants. They have broken the prescriptions of Imperial law and have profaned the Emperor's benevolence with their selfishness, and I will. I must punish them for it. Only the Emperor can judge our sins, argues Nathaniel. And only in death can we receive the Emperor's judgment. The Colonel completes the catechism. Nathaniel takes a long look at him, then turns away. Remember Nathaniel, the colonel calls after him. Serve the emperor today, for tomorrow you may be dead. And then, just for an instant, a tiny fraction of a second, there's a ghost of a smile on Colonel Schaefer's lips, a minuscule hint of satisfaction, like he knows something the rest of the galaxy doesn't. Cage, he calls like he must have sensed I was there, beckoning me over with a finger. As I'm sure you know, that was just the first assault. I do not know when the next one will come, so stay ready. It is only an hour until the sun goes down, so I think they will wait until nightfall. I want you and your platoon to stay near the gate. This first attack was just to test our defenses, to count our guns. They know we were most hard-pressed around the gate, so they'll throw the bulk of their forces there next time. We must hold the gate at all costs, Cage. Otherwise, it's all over. Stay close to the gate, but wait for my signal. Do not at any costs allow yourself to get drawn away from the gate. Is that clear? Perfectly, sir, I reply, as if I couldn't see the scenario for myself. This time we just faced gargoyles, termagants, and hormagons. They're all expendable troops. Next time, it'll be much worse. They'll come in with the warriors, the Carnifexes, and maybe even the big bug himself, the Hive Tyrant. 
You have your orders then, Lieutenant. Snap to it. I want clear fire for everyone in half an hour. Then he's off again, shouting for Green and Cronin. The Colonel was right, as I knew he would be. Emperor, take him. But he's always so damned right. Nightfall comes sharply. The Tyranid's waiting us out for the moment. I'll help Cronin's platoon rig up some searchlights scavenged from the Chimeras and get them set up on the wall. The constant hum of the portable generators fills the air. But listening won't do us any good, because those Tyranids can move as silent as you like when they want to. That's one of the scariest things about them. The silence. No battle cries. No war chants. Just waves of them sweeping on towards you. When they're fighting, they hiss a lot. But I doubt if they got any real language to speak of. They're just animals. Bugs. But they're well organized for all that. They're like the wasps I saw on Antrades, who seemed to know what each other were up to. When one of them found you, the rest would soon come buzzing in, just like the lictors finding their prey for the rest of the swarm. So I'm up on the wall, checking everything is okay, when the searchlights blaze on at last. The stupid grunts start angling them far away from the wall, like they want to get the earliest warning possible, which I can understand. Problem is, the light doesn't hit the ground before it's too weak to show anything. I grab the nearest one and point it further down, about 70 meters out. I catch a glimmer of movement and shout for the others to train on that point. What I see makes my spine tingle with fear. A sensation, I might add, that I'm not all that familiar with, though far too familiar for my own liking. There's a big brood of termagants out there, crawling through the grass on their bellies, sneaking really close. Behind them are crouched the warriors, big beasts, twice as tall as a man. Their four upper limbs evolved into a variety of deadly ranged and close combat weapons. They're creeping forward, bony joints and chitinous plates shown up in the white glare of the searchlights. The light glitters off their eyes, countless shining orbs reflected back at me. Those eyes seem dead. There's no emotion, nothing, not even a touch of hunger, which is what you'd expect considering that this race devours whole planets. No. The only eyes I've ever seen colder than those white fire stares are Colonel Schaefer's. And we all know he's not really human. Mark your targets! Open fire! I bellow. I see them opening up. First with the missile launchers and auto cannons, and then with volleys of lasgun fire as the Nids realize the game's up and they rise out of the grass and charge towards us. A wave of multi-limbed monstrosities intent on our destruction. I take one last look as they come streaming over the plain, blossoms of fire exploding in their mist, showing up their snarling faces in brief glimpses of hellfire before jumping down the steps three at a time to get back to my platoon. Right men, I tell them, stay steady, follow my lead, stay tight. If you get separated they'll pick you off no problem. When you shoot, aim for the flesh. Your last guns will have about as much effect on their carapace as punching a Lehman Russ. Watch your ammo counters too, cause tonight's gonna be a long haul, and I don't want to face those fragging bugs with just my bare hands. One final thing, don't get yourselves killed, cause otherwise I'm gonna have to put up with another fresh draft of no-hopers. If you let me down, sure as hell, I'm gonna make sure I come back and haunt you for the rest of your miserable lives, reminding you just what a bunch of fragging, slack-jawed sons of orcs you are. That gets a smile. Personally, I couldn't give a frag about all this pre-battle speech crap. But some of them need it, I can tell. Just like me, they're getting awful nervous. I mean, they're a bunch of hard-nosed, thick-skinned meatheads for the most part. But even when you got nothing but air between your ears, you can't get over the unreasoning horror that the tyranids bring out in you. It's not just like they kill you, they devour you. Take everything you are, everything you ever were gonna be, and change it, and pervert it into something else. It's a horrible thought, I don't mind telling you.
The fire's still pretty steady from the top of the wall, so I guess we're holding out okay. I'll give myself the luxury of watching the Battle Sisters for a while, fighting alongside the natives. It's a really bizarre scene, I can tell you. You have a thousand or so of those dark-skinned warriors, hurling spears and firing bows, their skin glistening with sweat, their booming war chants echoing down from the wall. And then there's the Sororitas. They're chanting too, their voices raised in constant prayer to the Emperor, a choir, all singing as one. I can't make out the words, but it reaches inside me, lifting my spirits. It's a song of defiance and devotion, and as they sing they fire methodical bursts from their bolters. Fusillade after fusillade pouring into the darkness, every round sending a streak of light into the shadows from its eternal propellant. Then, I see a swathe of the natives, jumping in all directions, screaming like mad, clawing at their faces and chests. That'll be a death spitter then. Fires some kind of explosive bug that sprays acid all over the place. Burns through near enough anything, given time, and against the exposed flesh of the native irregulars, it's utterly lethal. Dragging my eyes away from the scene, trying to turn a deaf ear to their agonized screeches, I watch what's happening around the gatehouse. There's hand-to-hand -hand fighting going on now, and I pick out the colonel. A glowing power sword in one fist, and a bolt pistol in the other. While the others are desperately hacking and slaying, he's just stepping to and fro, felling a foe with every blow or shot, as if the chaos going on around wasn't happening at all. I see the shape of a lictor rise up behind him, but he just turns on the spot, fills its face full of bolts, and then chops its legs from underneath it with two swings of the power sword, calm as you like, as if he were just taking a stroll in the morning airs. Damn, but he's so cold, it makes the battle sisters seem positively emotional, and the glance they reserve for scum like us would freeze worse than a night on Valhalla. Then something appears on the western gatehouse that almost makes me swallow my tongue in terror. Silhouetted against the rising moon is the figure of the Hive Tyrant. It's almost three times as tall as the men around it. Two arms are molded into some kind of massive living gun, while the other two end in a whip-like protrusion and a serrated bone sword. A thick tail lashes between its legs, tipped with a sting the size of your arm. Mandibles that can chew a man in two snap hungrily in its jaw, and its body is covered in chitinous armor and bony protrusions. It fires the venom cannon into the packed mass on the gatehouse, blasting apart guardsmen and tyranids alike. Its head stretches back and lets loose a horrifying bellowing screech, which seems to roll along the wall like a wave, sending men staggering in fear, making them pause in their fight so that they're cut down with ease by the termagants and warriors they're fighting. The tyrant steps down from the parapet, its hoofed feet sending splinters of masonry flying as it stamps down with all of its massive weight. Gazing around, it fixes its evil eyes on the colonel as he musters his men for a counterattack. They charge in, las bolts bouncing harmlessly off the monster's armored hide, their bayonets snapping against his chitinous plates. Then the bone sword sweeps down, and I see a spray of blood fountain into the air as four men are cut down with that single blow. The whip lashes out, its barbs tearing across the chest of another guardsman, his ragged corpse flung from the wall to land in a limp heap on the courtyard. Surely, even the colonel has met his match this time. He's chopping his way through a brood of warriors to get at the hive tyrant. There's a pause in the fighting, and he glances over the parapet to the ground outside. He stops for a moment, and looks over to where we're positioned. With a wave of his arms, he signals us to attack. Here we go again, last chances! I shout out and start heading for the wall. I've taken perhaps five steps when something seems wrong. I realize that I'm alone and I stop and look around. They're all just standing there, looking up at the hive tyrant as it butchers another squad of men. What the frag is this? I howl. I grab Sergeant Phoenix by his lapels and push him towards the wall. 
but he turns around and snarls at me. This is madness, he shouts over the cries from the slaughter on the wall. That's a fragging hive tyrant. It's gonna kill every one of us. We've got to get the hell out of here while we can. Deliverance has fallen, Cage. Face it. He calms down a little and fixes me with an intense stare. There's nothing more we can do. We've got to save ourselves. You ain't no fragging matter, Cage, and you know it. He's right. But then something catches my eye over their heads. There's lights dropping down from the stars again, curving down from orbit towards deliverance in a long arc. I glance back at the gatehouse and see the gates shuddering as some titanic beast tries to break them down. I make a decision. Look, I tell him, pointing up to the pinbricks of light falling to the south. There ain't no escaping deliverance, boys. That's more my set spores coming down. We're gonna be surrounded. There's no way we can get clear of this area before those things reach here. Cruzo, from Let Squad, opens his mouth to argue, but I cut him off. There ain't no getting out of this one, lads. We're all gonna die in deliverance. Now I see it two ways. You can die running from the fight, like the thieves and cowards everyone thinks we are. Sure, you can do that. Just get over the wall and hide out. But it won't take them long to find you. When you're all alone out there in the night, cowering in the grass, trying not to sh... A crash from the gatehouse distracts me, and I turn around to have a look. The chimera behind the gates is rocking heavily on its tracks now. It's gonna go over any second, so I better make this quick. For frag's sake, we ain't got anything worth fighting for except our pride. Right now, I don't give a frag about the natives, or the emperor, or the colonel. But what I do care about is how I'm gonna die. And it ain't gonna be with my back turned or on my knees. I'm gonna go down fighting like a man. If there's any men here with me, then you better come too. Otherwise, you boys can just go running off to cry, dying on your bellies like the scum you are. I spit on the ground in front of them, and then start walking towards the gate. I'm taking a hell of a risk, because if they don't follow me, I'm going to be standing in front of the gate on my own, when whatever it is that's so big and nasty to batter its way through three feet of plastil gets through. Then I hear the thud of boots, and they're there with me, so I guess the suckers fell for it. I look up, and I see that the hive tyrant's gone from the gate tower, but I can still see the colonel slicing away with that big power sword of his. Emperor knows how the fraggy managed that one. Well, if I live to see the dawn, I might just find out. With a screech of tearing plastil, the gates are torn apart, and the chimera gets shunted towards us. There's a sound like a tank ramming a building, and the personnel carrier is flung upwards, spinning through the air. It crashes down, and its fuel goes up. A massive fireball that shoots 30 meters into the air. In the flames and smoke, I see a sight that will follow me to my grave. Long may it be before I get there. In the red glare comes this huge tyrannid creature, about four meters tall and just as wide. It's some kind of carnifex, but nothing I've ever seen before. It's got four massive scythe-like arms, but the bony extrusions across its shoulders jut forwards, rows of spikes thrust outwards like it's some kind of living battering ram. Nestled between its immense shoulders, its head is kind of fused with its chest. A large, fang-ringed mouth open in a permanent roar. Pieces of twisted metal hang from the spines as it stomps through the smoke and flames like some monstrous devil from the pits of hell. Without pause, its shoulders aside the wreck of the Chimera, and I'm horrified to see that some of the burning vehicle tears off along one of the creature's armored plates. The debris carries on burning, the flames crawling along the Carnifex's carapace, but it just keeps advancing steadily, as if nothing was happening. Blow that bastard away! I shout, and everyone snaps out of the spell. Bryden opens up with the last cannon, a bolt of energy powerful enough to cripple battle tanks, scoring a wound across the Carnifex's armored skull, making thick, dark blood dripple down the exoskeleton of his body. The heavy bolter in Francis' squad kicks in, 
explosive shells rippling across legs as thick as tree trunks in a shower of detonations. But it still comes on, the ground shaking as those massive feet thud down into the dirt. It pauses for a second, its beady eyes reflecting the flickering flames and fixes us with a stare. Its arms arc back, spreading wider than the length of a tank, and its cavernous mouth opens to bellow forth a roar that can probably be heard off-world. It breaks into a run, gathering momentum. Lads gun fire, heavy bolter shots, and lads cannon shots bounce off it as it lumbers towards us. Once more its mouth opens for another terrifying roar, but Bryden picks his moment precisely his aim guided by the Emperor, I'm sure. And the next Laz Cannon bolt lands in its mouth, smashing its head to a pulp, scattering fragments of skull across the courtyard. For a moment, I think that even that isn't enough to stop it, as it comes rumbling on towards us. But then the rest of the body catches up with what's happening, and it collapses to the ground with dark, thick eye core oozing out in a gigantic puddle around the mammoth corpse. I breathe a sigh of relief, glad that those useless fraggers decided to follow me after all. Otherwise I'd be a little more than a smear along those claws by now. However, just as my heart rate drops to something just below a million beats a minute, the rest of the Tyranids start to pour through the opening. At the front is a brood of warriors, death spitters and devourers firing as they advance. Men are going down all around me and a stray spatter of acid splashes onto my arm. The pain is almost unbearable, and I stoop to grab a handful of dirt to rub the acid off. My right arm's almost numb, so I drop my last pistol and grab my chainsaw in my left hand. The lead warriors go down to fire from the last cannon and heavy bolters, but there's more and more of the things pouring through the gap now. I look around to see how the platoon's holding out, and I see there's only about two dozen of us left now. Franz catches my gaze, and I see his desperation turn into fierce pride in that single glance. As if a subconscious order is given, we all charge forwards, throwing ourselves at the tide of beasts sweeping into deliverance. My chainsaw bites flesh, and I hear an inhuman shriek of pain. I'm not really looking at what's happening. I'm just chopping, left, and right, hacking blindly, knowing that I can't miss in the tight press of alien creatures swirling around me. Then a massive clawed paw, larger than a Cathelan Cudbears, comes out of the darkness, smashing me across the face. My head spins, and I only dimly feel a sharp blade cutting across my thigh. I feel something wet and sticky pouring down my legs, and I gaze down numbly, seeing my blood spilling to the dirt. I try to take a step forward, but all my strength seems to have been sapped from me. I drop to my knees, feeling rough, alien skin rasping against me, pushing past, leaving me for dead. Then a shadow descends, and I feel like I'm falling, falling down a deep, dark hole. My ears pick up singing my mind ringing to the sound of angelic voices singing the praises of the Emperor. So this is what it's like to die. There is an Emperor after all, and I shall receive my judgment, just like Nathaniel when the Colonel said. My thoughts are getting slow, but for the first time in ten years of fighting, I feel proud. I didn't run this time. I stayed. I'm dying, but I went down fighting. Surely that's got to count for something. I can hear voices, shouting, orders being bellowed. So, I guess I'm alive then. And I really was right about those falling lights. I tried to open my eyes, but the left one seems closed up. I raise an arm feeling so weak and touch my temple. Instant pain tells me that there's a bruise the size of a small moon up there. 
and it's probably blood crusting up my eye. My right arm is swathed in bandages and won't move at all. Through my good eye, I see that there's troops running backwards and forwards, and I watch a line of three Lehman Rust tanks warming up, ready to go out of the gate. I guess I'm propped up against the redoubt. I can feel rough stonework poking into my back. I turn my head, slowly, left and right, wary of dizziness and nausea, and I see that there's others like me, bandaged and bloody, all along the redoubt. The colonel walks past, and he notices that I'm awake. He strides up and stands in front of me, thankfully blocking out the bright light of the sun. I can't see his face. It's in shadow, but he's looking down at me. Still alive then, Cage. He demands. His voice is gruff as ever. Afraid so, sir? Guess I can't kick the habit just yet. I try to manage a smile, but my face is just a mass of aching and pain. I heard what happened, he says, dropping down on one knee so that I can see those icy eyes as they fix me with their stare. Tell me one thing, Cage. You could have run out on me. You had the chance, and you've done it before. What made you fight? I'll fix him with my good eye returning his gaze with a steady look of my own. Well, sir, it's like this, I explain. I saw the lights coming down, and I knew they were Imperial Guard transports. My setic spores just come straight down, but they had a landing trajectory, so I knew that deliverance was saved. Thing was, though, we had to hold out, because if the Tyranids got into the compound, we'd all be dead. There's nowhere to run from those creatures. The colonel frowns at me. So why did you tell your men that there were more spores coming down rather than the relief force? He asks. You must know why, sir, I reply, because it seems so obvious to me. If I told them that help was on the way, they'd lose what little stomach they had left. They'd think they could give up, get away from here. But like I said, there wasn't any escape from deliverance, not a chance. So I did the only thing I could. I stripped them of that false hope. I gave them nothing to live for except life itself. You see, sir, when you ain't got Fraggle worth fighting for, you'll still fight to be alive. Give a man a chance to back down and he'll take it. But give him nothing, and he'll grab what he can with both hands and not let go for as long as he can. He'll fight to his last breath, just to take one more breath. To feel his heart beat just once more before he dies. If you just stick a man in the middle of a fight and give him a gun, he'll fight like a cornered rat because there's nothing else he can do. That's the way the last chances work, sir. It's exactly what you do to us all. We ain't got no choice but to fight, and fight good, because if we don't, we're dead. None of us wants to die, so we'll do all we can, everything that's possible, including going on your damn suicide mission just to breathe one more time. It's why I fight, why they fight. He just grunts and stands up. He turns to walk away, but I call after him. There's another reason why I'll fight my damnedest, sir. He spins around and looks at me, an eyebrow raised in question. I... I ain't gonna give you the fragging satisfaction of seeing me dead just yet, sir.